Hey, welcome everyone to the Education and Economic Development Subcommittee. I want to just let everyone know, <clears throat> watching in the public, we have a number of members who are presenting bills and other committees. So if you don't see them, they're not absent. They're just doing work elsewhere. Uh, we have a full agenda today. We'll start with the Maryland School for the Deaf. Laura Hyde is our analyst. Ms. Hyde, you're on. Hello, thank you, Chairman Barnes. Again, my name is Laura Hyde, and I'm the analyst for Maryland School for the Deaf. I'm going to share my screen and start the presentation. All right, if you can please look on page one, this is the operating budget summary. Uh, Maryland School for the Deaf's budget uh, in fiscal 2023 increases by 3.2 million or 7.9% to 43.7 million. And this budget change is primarily reflected in increases to personnel expenses, contractual services, and plant and maintenance operations. If you could please look on page two, exhibit one, federal stimulus fund distribution. In fiscal 20 and 21, Maryland School for the Deaf received $1.2 million in federal stimulus funds based on enrollment. Uh, the amounts were 430,000 or 37% in year one funds, 479,000 or 41% in year two funds, and 254,000 or 22% in SEA, ESSER two funds. If you could please turn to page three. This is exhibit two, federal stimulus fund expenditures for fiscal 21 and 22. You can see that MSD has until September, 2022 to spend gear one funds and until September, 2023 to spend gear two and ESSER two funds. To date, the school has spent approximately 474,000 or 41% of grant funds as follows, 173,000 or 36% on information technology, 128,000 or 27% on curriculum, 114,000 or 24% on equipment, 36,000 or 8% on personal protective equipment and 23,000 or 5% on instructional supplies. If you could please turn to page four, exhibit three. This is the overview of agency spending. In MSD's 20, 2023 proposed budget, salaries and wages total $33.3 million or 76% of MSD's total allowance. Contractual employment accounts for 4.5 million or 10%. Contractual services total 2.6 million. Supplies and materials receive 1.3 million of the allowance and fuel and utilities receive 800,000 of the allowance. All remaining objects total less than 1% of this allowance. If you could please turn to page five, exhibit four, Maryland School for the Deaf Enrollment. An enrollment formula in section 83A09 of the education article determines MSD's annual enrollment count, which uses a four year average to mitigate sharp increases and decreases. For the 2021 2022 school year, MSD's total enrollment is 550 students, which includes 53 enhanced services students. 70 early intervention students, and 427 school age students, which for formula funding purposes totals 462 students. If you'll please turn to page five, proposed budget. Due to an increase in the per pupil amount mandated in chapter 36 of 2021, MSD's per pupil funding increases from $7,000 $7,390 in fiscal 22 to $8,310 in fiscal 23. MSD's formula enrollment also increases by 14 students from 448 in fiscal 22 to 462 in fiscal 23. These changes result in an increase in MSD's formula funding of approximately $2.5 million, which is 7% greater than fiscal 2022. The total change is $3.2 million with uh, the largest increase in personnel expenses, 
which is approximately 1.3 million in general funds. Of this amount, reclassifications total $919,000, which includes an increase in salary for the new superintendent and funds to realign positions in alignment with 30, Chapter 36 requirements. MSD's other general fund increases total approximately 1.9 million and include 563,000 for contractual services, 547,000 for plant maintenance and operations, 203,000 for contractual services, 89,000 for food services, maintenance and cleaning equipment, 68,000 for non-instructional materials and supplies due to students returning to campus and other changes. If you could please turn to page eight, personnel. Maryland School for the Deaf is authorized 334.5 regular positions and 82.4 contractual positions in the fiscal 2023 allowance. Due to decreased enrollment, contractual positions for instructional personnel decreased by almost eight positions from fiscal 2022 to 23. For fiscal 2023, MSD has less than 1% budgeted turnover rate. You could please turn to page nine, exhibit six, students headed to college, training, and work. Exhibit six shows that MSD's 2021 graduating class, 57% of students plan to attend college, which due to challenges to these students faced in learning in a pandemic, represents a 33% decline from the 2020 graduating class. MSD reports that students in the 2021 graduating class are attending community college for a year or plan to attend college in the fall of 2022. For MSD students pursuing a certificate of program completion, 47% plan to work or enter a training program after graduation, even though they have faced difficulty finding work or entering a suitable training program during the pandemic. MSD anticipates that the percentage of students headed to college, training, or work will return to pre-pandemic levels with the graduating class of 2022. MSD does not have any issues. The rest of this analysis provides information on MSD's return to in-person learning, an audit update, and details of their superintendent search. DLS concurs with the governor's allowance, and this ends my presentation, and I stand for questions. Thank you, Ms. Hyde, for the great presentation. Any questions for the analyst? Okay, well, we have uh, the agency with us. It should be quick without any issues, but Ms. Ann Miller, welcome. Welcome your team. You can introduce them as you see necessary. And, um, or we may have Ms. Ortiz as well. Whoever wants to take it. Hello. Hello. Let's go first. Yes, I'm going to go first. Hello. Um, let's get Brenda spotlighted for a second, the interpreter. Could you please? Switch? There we go. Oh, you got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Ann Miller. I am the Chief Financial Officer and the Chief of Operations at the Maryland School for the Deaf. And this year I am half of the uh, interim acting superintendent as we search for uh, a new superintendent to run our school. And now I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Jen Ortiz. Can we spotlight Jen Ortiz? Um, just a moment for the interpreter to find Ms. Ortiz. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Ortiz. I'm the interim, the other half of um, the superintendent's office working with Ann. I'm the interim chief educational programs officer. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all. MSD continues to offer a rich language environment through academics, opportunities, and whole child approach for our deaf and hard of hearing students. 
Um, in the midst of the pandemic and multiple challenges, our school continues to thrive with creativity. And our theme this year is Forward Together. This is exactly what we're doing. We thank you for your support for our school and we concur with the budget as submitted. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you all. Are there any questions for the agency? I don't see any, but I will just say thank you all very much for being with us and the great service you provide. Oh, you can always count on our vice chair, come through with a question. Vice Chair Solomon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this, is a, this is a good natured one. I just wanna know, is there an Oscar party planned, a uh, watch party for the, for the documentary? There is, absolutely. We are currently in talks about figuring out possibly Sunday, Sunday making it a challenge because it's at eight o'clock in the evening. So we're trying to be creative and possibly doing things a little bit earlier, but we are currently working it out, yes. Well, congratulations, we're all, we're all pulling for you. Thank you so much. You're here, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. We're very and excited. Thank you, and we're, we're proud of the great work you do for our students in this state. And thank you so much, keep it up, we're with you. With that, we will turn to uh, Department of Commerce. And thank you all again. Uh, Emily Haskell is our analyst. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, my name is Emily Haskell and I'll be presenting the budget analysis for the Maryland Department of Commerce. In the budget summary on page one, you can see first that Commerce provided a significant amount of COVID-19 relief in fiscal 2021. And then from fiscal 2022 to the fiscal 2023 allowance, Commerce's budget increases by 10%, $190 million. General funds increased by nearly $33 million, mostly due to the More Jobs for Marylanders program, which I'll discuss later. But there are also significant increases for tourism grants, the grant to the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, uh, and some new programs, such as a nonprofit shared services support program and a manufacturing modernization program. The small sliver of COVID-19 relief you see in fiscal 2022 is $5 million from the American Rescue Plan for a telework grant program. And this program continues in fiscal 2023, but is funded with $1 million in general funds instead. Not reflected in this chart are the funds from the supplemental budget that was introduced yesterday. As you heard earlier this afternoon, the biggest item in the supplemental budget for commerce is $50 million in general funds for a new rural economic development program. From these funds, Maryland's five rural regional councils will be granted $10 million each for economic development projects, including infrastructure, business attraction, workforce, and entrepreneurship programs. Exhibit two on page six shows a breakdown of the fiscal 2023 allowance, once again, not including the supplemental budget. Marketing, tourism, and the arts make up 28% of the budget, as does financial assistance to businesses while the More Jobs for Marylanders tax credit grows to 16% of the department's overall allowance in fiscal 2023. And the next thing I wanna bring your attention to is uh, the Maryland State Arts Council or MSAC formula. In general, MSAC's general fund appropriation is required to grow at the same rate as the expected growth of the general fund. And the BRFA of 2017 specified that special funds MSAC receives from admissions and amusement tax revenues, totaling $1 million annually, must be included in the base for the calculation. DPM recently changed its interpretation of the BRFA language on how those revenues are used in the calculation. Both the old and new calculation methods use the emissions and amusement tax revenues, but the new method then removes the $1 million in revenues after the growth calculation. And exhibit four shows the effects of this change in calculation method over time with MSAC receiving about $16 million less cumulatively by fiscal 2026. When the 2017 BRFA was passed, there was a sunset of fiscal 2021 on the distribution of admissions and amusement tax revenues to MSAC. But chapter 14 of 2021 extended the distribution permanently, which also made permanent the faster growth rate of the MSAC appropriation. As noted in the analysis, the General Assembly may wish to consider clarifying how these special fund revenues should be used in calculating the mandated general fund appropriation for MSAC. The next program I want to discuss is the Small Minority and Women-Owned Businesses Account, or SMWOBA. This program is funded primarily through video lottery terminal revenues, and the fiscal 2023 allowance includes $19.3 million from that source. These funds are loaned to businesses through eight fund managers across the state, and Commerce also plans to solicit applications for up to three new fund managers. 
As of the end of fiscal 2021, the fund managers had over $14 million combined in the checking accounts they control, as well as an additional $17 million still available for them to draw from funds held at Commerce. As the recent average of transactions in the program is about $10.5 million annually, DLS has asked the department to comment on the capacity of the fund managers to administer the increasing level of video lottery terminal funds that are available through the Simobo program. Simobo also receives a small amount of funds from a couple other sources. There is a proposed efficiency for fiscal 2022 to provide $650,000 in Simobo for a sports wagering assistance fund. These funds are available from sports wagering licensing fees and will be, a use, and will be used to assist small businesses entering the sports betting market. The fiscal 2023 allowance also includes $150,000 for this purpose. Lastly, Simoba receives funding from the Strategic Energy Investment Fund, or CEF, including $500,000 in the fiscal 2023 allowance for the Clean Energy Jobs Act of 2019. This funding is intended to assist small businesses in the clean energy industry, although Commerce has not used any of the CEF funding it has received so far and does not plan to make use of the funds. The department noted that requirements on this funding are too onerous for small businesses, and DLS has asked Commerce to discuss what statutory changes could be made to the program to allow the use of this funding as intended by the General Assembly. I'm going to turn now to tourism. The fiscal 2023 allowance includes an increase of $2 million, or 47%, for the Maryland Tourism Development Board to provide grants to the state's destination marketing organizations to enhance marketing efforts for tourism. Commerce was also recently awarded $9.6 million in federal funds through the American Rescue Plan for the purpose of supporting the tourism industry. These funds were included in yesterday's supplemental budget with $1.5 million added in fiscal 2022 and $8.1 million for fiscal 2023. The department plans to use these funds to provide additional funding for the destination marketing organizations, as well as other efforts to support outdoor recreation, fund the department's scenic byways marketing promotion, uh, and support events that draw tourism. Because of the availability of substantial additional federal funding, DLS recommends reducing the general fund appropriation of the Maryland Tourism Development Board by $2 million, which would level fund the general funds for the program at the fiscal 2022 funding level. The first and only issue in the analysis is the More Jobs for Marylanders program, which provides an income tax credit to expanding businesses, mostly in the manufacturing sector, for wages paid to qualified positions. New businesses in tier one areas, which are defined as certain counties as well as opportunity zones, are eligible for additional benefits. Under current law, companies can enroll in the program through June 1st of this year. Senate Bill 391 and House Bill 418 would extend this enrollment date by five years. And once enrolled, companies can claim tax credits for 10 years of benefits. Exhibit five shows how businesses are moving through the program currently with a total of 54 businesses having at least been issued an initial certificate. This initial certificate indicates the maximum amount of credits a company can claim for a given benefit year once all hiring requirements are met. And once that happens, companies then claim their final credit. And half of the 54 businesses have progressed to that final credit stage for at least one benefit year. And one business has made it as far as claiming its third year of benefits. In total, $6.9 million in final tax credits have been claimed as of December. Exhibit six shows various data points of interest about the program. Some things I'll point out are that very few new businesses are participating in the program, just six out of the 54. Also, even though the program was expanded in the 2019 session to non-manufacturing businesses that are located in opportunity zones, only one non-manufacturing business has taken advantage of the program so far although there are a handful more in the pipeline. Next, as you can see by the number of qualified jobs, most of the projects that businesses are claiming credits for are somewhat small in the area of 10 to 25 jobs in the first two years. But there are also some really big projects representing hundreds of jobs. A handful of large projects account for the vast majority of credits claimed by dollar value, with the largest three projects accounting for more than half of the year one credits issued and Northrop Grumman accounting for nearly 60% of the total credits claimed so far. And this brings me to my next point, which is that projects typically grow quite significantly from their first year credit to the second year of benefits, with almost all projects that have progressed that far more than doubling in size and credit amount, and Northrop's project increasing by over 1,000%. These increases between year one and year two are important in terms of the overall fiscal impact of the program because while there is a $9 million limit on commerce authorizing year one credits, there is no limit on the amount of subsequent years benefits. 
Because the program's costs are driven by large projects and projects can grow in future years of benefits without limits, one or two large projects enrolling in the program can have significant effects on the overall cost. Lastly, on this chart at the bottom, you can see that there's quite a lot of variance in the lag time between when businesses are issued an initial tax credit certificate and when they finally claim that credit, with the average being about a year. But in one case, a company claimed the initial and final credit at the same time, while another company took well over two years. So keep that in mind as I move to the next chart, because this time lag is one of the reasons predicting the year-to-year -year cost of the program is so difficult. Exhibit seven shows the past appropriations and program activity, as well as the estimates going forward. The fiscal 2023 allowance includes $30 million for more jobs for Marylanders, and there is also a proposed deficiency of $7.5 million. Previously, the program has received appropriations of $20 million over fiscal 2019 to 2022. Uh, and the appropriation required to meet program demand is expected to grow each year, reaching $62 million in fiscal 2026. And this is under the assumption that the program is not extended. Also, as shown in the red numbers in the last line, the budget does not include enough funding either in fiscal 2023 or in the deficiency to meet Commerce's estimates of tax credit activity, falling, falling almost $15 million short. Those estimates are a bit rough, as I mentioned, because of the difficulty in predicting the timing of projects. So the department also made a much more conservative estimate for the current year needs, based on current applications for initial certificates that the, that the department has been unable to fund so far, as well as a survey of projects. And by that more conservative estimate, the proposed efficiency for fiscal 2022 is only short of the demand by a little less than $150,000. DLS has asked Commerce to comment on how it would handle any potential shortfalls in fiscal 2022 or 2023. So that was a lot of information about the program, but the main takeaways I want to leave you with are that as the program is hitting its stride, the costs are increasing significantly. And also those costs are hard to predict, both due to project timing, as well as the fact that large projects moving through the program can have an outsized impact on the costs. Finally, this page shows the recommendation to reduce funding for the Maryland Tourism Development Board based on the availability of federal funds. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Haskell, for the great presentation. Any questions for the analyst? All right, seeing none, I have um, to pause really quickly, Mr. Secretary. We do need to go back to Maryland School for the Deaf. I apologize to everyone. I did miss a witness. and I, We did get our interpreter back, I believe. Yep, there she is. Welcome back, Ms. Rose. Uh, Todd Reynolds, you have two minutes. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for... Um... I'm making time for this. Um, my name is Todd Reynolds. I'm the political coordinator for the American Federation of Teachers in Maryland. Uh, on behalf of the Maryland School for the Deaf Faculty and Staff Association, AFT Local 4828, we just wanted to draw your attention to a number of concerning issues about the School for the Deaf uh, operating budget. Our written testimony goes into greater detail, so let me highlight just a few elements. Um, first, um, it's true that numerous state agencies have been underfunded and staffing shortages have hit crisis levels. Um, because it is both a state agency and a public K-12 school, the extent of the crisis at the Maryland School for the Deaf should be particularly alarming. Um, the state has recently recognized profoundly negative impacts underfunding has on our public school systems and work to rectify that through the implementation of Blueprint. Uh, it is important that we not leave Maryland School for the Deaf uh, behind as we work to rectify historic shortchanging of Maryland students at the county level by paying our education staff appropriately. Uh, and offering them the supports needed that they pro to properly educate Maryland residents. Um, just in the past week, uh, the faculty and staff at the Maryland School for the Deaf began circulating a petition uh, to Governor Hogan calling for the restoration of employee step increases, full staffing, and a commitment to rec recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce that reflects our deaf student population. Within a week, the petition has already been signed by two thirds of the faculty and staff at the School for the Deaf, highlighting the import of this issue on the school community. Uh, secondly, we wanted to uh, agree that uh, uh, with you all, uh, or agree that um, uh, staffing shortages have ballooned over the past year. Uh, the staff cites a handful of factors, uh, 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 DLS cites a handful of factors, high cost of living in Maryland, a number of staff leaving the school outright, and a return to in-person instruction among those factors. That leads to the growth in the vacancy rate. However, it's unclear to us at this point why the school has not utilized any additional dollars coming from the federal government in the form of GEAR or ESSER funds to help stabilize that workforce, uh, prevent employee attrition, and incentivize in-person learning by making employee compensation that more competitive. Uh, 
Guidance from the Federal Department of Education explicitly states these dollars can be used in such a ma manner. Does the administration plan to use any of its additional federal dollars to address the staffing crisis by fairly compensating its workforce? And if not, why not? Finally, the implementation, the blueprint for education is bumping the per pupil funding uh, flowing from the state to the school. However, as one of the key participants in Kerwin uh, uh, that authored the recommendations became the blueprint, we at AFT know a vital component of that blueprint is to increase the per pupil amount so that more teachers may be able to collaborate with their peers and develop their skills outside of the classroom instruction time. In order to implement this, public school systems in the state must significantly increase their educational workforce. It appears that, according to DLS budget analysis, despite an increase in per pupil funding thanks to the blueprint, and despite enrollment numbers expected to return to pre-pandemic levels, the school has no plans to increase its workforce at all, much less plans to fill the vacancies it has. If that's the case, how exactly does the institution plan to use its increase in per pupil funding from, from, from the blueprint? Again, we go into greater detail uh, for some of these questions in our written. Um, we hope you all at the committee will explore answers to these questions as it considers the school's 2023 operating budget. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Any questions for our AFT representative? Okay, and Mr. Reynolds, I again apologize for having missed you the first go around, but thanks for hanging in there with us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, that will wrap up School for the Deaf. Mr. Vice Chair, did you have a question for Ms. Haskell? I saw you start to raise your hand and I moved over to... I, uh, I, I did, Mr. Chair, thank you. I was just gonna ask uh, Ms. Haskell, thank you for, for the presentation as always. Um, could you just give maybe a quick summary of what some of the DLS draft recommendations were on the More Jobs for Maryland Tax Credit Program? and. Have we received the updated, um, I know that called for a, a report from Labor and Commerce by December of 2021. I may have missed it. Do you know, have we gotten that yet? I would have to check and see if we've received that yet. Uh, and I would have to pull up the draft recommendations to remember what those were. It's been a while since I've looked at them. I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot if it's- uh, I can follow up with you. Okay, thank, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, we have the agency here, so maybe we can follow up there. Uh, I think back for second second round, Secretary Gill. I'm glad <laughs> to see you back. Hey, good to see you again. Yeah, congratulations, and thanks yeah. for continuing your public service and agreeing to come back to serve our state. So thanks, welcome, Mr. you're Chair. on. Thank you. Uh, want me to jump right in? You can jump right in, and you can introduce any members of your team that you need to handle any portions of the analysis or any of the questions. No, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, and sub and subcommittee members. It's great to see everyone, uh, most of whom I know, and it's uh, it's great to be with you this afternoon. And uh, and my team is here. I've I've got them in the wings, um, so that uh, when it comes to some of the questions, I want to be able to, to for us to be as um, as uh, thorough as we can be with uh, responding to those questions. So we're here. We're we're here, Mr. Chairman, for that. And, and I would like to single out uh, Emily. Um, Emily, you did a really outstanding job in your, in your analysis. You were very thorough. And, um, uh, and again, thank you very much for, for the work you've done on, on everything. And, uh, and hopefully we've, we've gotten a lot of the responses back to, to everyone. Uh, so please, let me just, uh, I'll just be a, a few minutes and highlight some, uh, some aspects of our, of our budget. Um, as many of you have seen, the uh, the total budget for FY23 is a uh, 190 million dollars, which uh, is an increase, and it's an excellent budget for us to be able to continue the work of economic development on behalf of the state of Maryland. Uh, 122 million in general funds, 64 in special, and four million in federal funds. I mean, we have a total of 188 um, permanent positions at Commerce and. I think that number might have been in the low 200s uh, when I was here, Mr. Chairman, for Chapter One. Um, and I am uh, I am absolutely amazed in such a positive way about the work that's been done in the last uh, couple years with a pandemic. At the same time, our pipeline of prospects for Maryland and new business that we've been able to create for Maryland. Um, I commend my my predecessor uh, Kelly Schultz. Um, team Commerce did a heck of a job over that period of time. Um, attracting businesses, just to highlight some of our programs, uh, many of them of which you're familiar with. Uh, MEDAF, which we 
we uh, we altered the name of MEDAF uh, to Advantage Maryland a couple years ago. That continues to be um, arguably our, our most important program. It's it's been around for many years and it it adds great value to our story out in the marketplace. MJM, um, I believe this is year three for MJM. It was passed when I was in the commerce role, uh, chapter one. Um, it's been very successful, and as and as Emily pointed out, it's just starting to uh, hit its stride. Um, our pipeline, as we uh, look at it today, about two thirds of our pipeline. We have about fifty plus customers in our pipeline. Strong, strong prospects for Maryland. They range all over the board in size. About two thirds of those uh, prospects um, will take advantage of MJM. Um, and the beautiful thing is about it, our 24 jurisdictions, um, we have a prospect in almost every single one of those jurisdictions. And in the area of manufacturing, um, um, and again, Eastern Shore uh, has quite a few of those prospects for the MJM. Um, Maryland Small Business, uh, Ms. Bitfo, which has been around for, I wanna say it's going on uh, 26, 28 years. Ms. Bitfo continues to be strong. Uh, 5.4 million is in the budget to support those businesses who are who have the are most challenged to be able to secure uh, uh, financing. Uh, Women-owned small business, minority businesses continues to be an important story for us in the small business environment of Maryland. Um, in the VLT program, uh, it, it's that it's that acronym, that mouthful of a word, uh, Swamoba. I can't even say it. Swamoba. We're going to work on that one too. But that's our VLT program, which uh, has about $20 million uh, to support um, a similar group of customers uh, and, and, and companies throughout the state of Maryland, uh, critically important to the small business programs. Key industry sectors, let me just comment on that. And, and it's one of the beauties of, of Maryland, which very few states in the country can make the statement about the diversity of industry sectors that we have in the state of Maryland and how strong they are. Um, everything from cyber, life sciences, we have never had a pipeline which is quite as rich and robust as we currently have in the life sciences sector. Uh, advanced manufacturing. I mean, the beautiful thing about MJM and manufacturing jobs is that on average, the manufacturing jobs pay about 30% more than the other jobs in our economy. Um, and in the state of Maryland, many of those manufacturing jobs are in advanced manufacturing, where it's a whole different skill set. We've been out of the widget business for probably going on a couple decades, and it's heavily oriented towards advanced manufacturing. We continue to support the biotech uh, investment tax incentive credit. Uh, $12 million, the demand continues to be high. Uh, it supports that very large multi, multi, multi billion dollar industry called life sciences in the state of Maryland. Um, we have a million dollars in our budget for the Maryland Manufacturing Modernization Programs, providing grants to companies who are focused on 4.0 manufacturing. And if I had to try to come up with some simple definition of 4.0, it's heavily automated, it's heavily robotic, it's heavily data driven um, with IT having a, a, an underlying uh, part of it in the, uh, in the infrastructure. Uh, to comment on tourism, film and arts for just a couple of minutes. Uh, budget, strong budget for FY23. Uh, I will comment on tourism in just a second uh, and the uh, proposed cut, but tourism, film and the arts, um, it's, it's, come, it's come back. We've always been strong in these areas uh, the pandemic, we, we survived. Um, we've seen significant progress over the last 12 months. The trajectory is positive for uh, tourism and for the arts. Um, and in tourism, uh, which includes a $2 million increase to the Maryland Tourism Development Board. The Maryland State Arts Council, uh, the Arts Day, I think was about 10, 12 days ago. Uh, it was virtual. Um, but the arts in Maryland, I've, I've made the comment recently at, the, at our other uh, hearing relative to our budget. Um, as Secretary of Commerce, I am, of all the things that I'm proud about in this role, um, how significant of a commitment we have as a state to the arts. Um, we, rank, uh, we rank fourth in the country per capita in terms of our spend on, on the arts. And I think that's just outstanding. 
Um, DLS uh, did recommend a cut to tourism. Um, here's my comment on that. I, I obviously strongly disagree. Um, uh, Chairman, I probably would could make a case of all the things that tax dollars coming to commerce and what we invest in. Tourism has as strong a return on the money we invest as anything that we do inside of commerce. So that, that would be the comment I'd make about the $2 million cut is it has a high, high return on those tourism dollars. Um, that really uh, is my remarks. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be back. I had a blast the first time around. I didn't see it coming when I got a call from the governor a, a couple months back to say, uh, you know, he said, Chairman, he said, let's, he said, I'd love to put the band back together. Your, your successor has to focus on, uh, on other things. And I said, once my wife said, okay, I said, Gov, I'm all in. So, so here I am for 2022 and, and glad to be part of it. And, uh, and I hope that we can keep the budget just where it is and, and keep the progress going uh, uh, for the state of Maryland. So, so thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, subcommittee for, for uh, listening. And, and we're here for questions. I've, I've got Team Commerce uh, right here with me. So anything at all. Yep. Well, we're glad to see you back. Glad to have somebody with some experience doing the last you know, 10, 12 months of the term here. So it's helpful yeah. rather than just have somebody come in new. So I'm happy for that. Um, I do know that our vice chair was striking on some subject matters with Ms. Haskell and probably is going to want to follow up with those. Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you again. Thanks. Uh, thanks. As, as we talked before, I appreciate your your second run uh, in the service of the state. Um, I think, yeah, I had two things I wanted to, to ask you about. Yeah. One, I think we'll, we'll probably see much more eye to eye on than the other. Um, and so I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, I had a really great conversation with the folks at, uh, at Maryland Nonprofits about the, um, the nonprofit uh, back end program. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I was hoping, and I know it's something I've talked to your staff for a, for a while about is potentially, you know, seeing if we could expand that to um, to include child care providers. You know, it's something that MSDE has talked about wanting to do as well, but, um, you know, sort of the same premise, uh, you know, a lot of providers obviously are, you know, mom and pop operations and um, a lot of child care providers get into it, uh, but don't necessarily have the business knowledge. So would love to, you know, see if your agency would be willing to, to work with MSDE and maybe we could think about expanding that to, to make sure we've got the services for, for child care providers in addition to nonprofits? Yeah, you know, uh, Delegate, um, you know my, excuse me a second. Let me grab a water, one sec. Whoop. All right, I'm ready now. No, I started to say, Jared, we had that conversation and uh, um, uh, Maryland Family Network is, is just an example of an organization that's very special to me and the work that they do for uh, child care in the state of Maryland. Um, so I think the dialogue, to continue the dialogue in terms of how we can do more, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wide open to that. Um, so I, I, I understand where you're coming from and I'm, I'm supportive. I mean, but I, again, I'm speaking for, I'm speaking for, uh, for, for, for me at the moment, um, but on board with more discussion. I, I appreciate that. Second topic, I don't know that we'll, we'll see eye to eye on. Um, I did pull up the recommendations and one of the DLS recommendations from the report was that um, we should allow the program to sunset. And I guess one of the things in particular in the budget uh, analysis that was kind of concerning to me, and I mean, I don't know if you want to comment on it. I mean, so Northrop Grumman has an annual revenue of literally $33 billion last year. Um, and it seems like they took the vast majority of this credit. Um, and I, I guess I, I struggle with the fact that we have a fund balance, you know, we have a program meant to be designed specifically for small, small minority and women owned businesses. And we've got all this money sitting in that fund that's not getting out the door. And yet we have this tax credit program that is subsidizing a company, frankly, that I think most, most people of all political stripes would agree does not need any additional incentives to, you know, to, to hire folks. So, I, I mean, it's just a major concern for me as I look at where our, our dollars are going. Yeah, let me uh, here. Here, I'll, I'll share uh, share some thoughts with you. And um, and Northrop Grumman, I, uh, I I certainly like we all are uh, proud of the fact that they have such a significant presence in the state of Maryland, so, somewhere north of uh, thirteen thousand employees, and uh, their average uh, wage is somewhere in the neighborhood of a uh, hundred and thirty thousand um, uh, dollars per employee. 
Um, when the program was created, the program didn't uh, it, it never attempted to uh, discriminate between uh, a large uh, um, uh, company such as Northrop Grumman and a, and a small company, maybe in the aquaculture space on the Eastern shore. Um, Northrop Grumman um, makes a tremendous contribution to our state. They, uh, they, they do earn the, the Maryland, uh, the more job for Maryland credits. Uh, the thing about a Northrop Grumman is they have manufacturing facilities all over the country. There's no question. They do always have the option of where they might move some of those programs. So I, uh, I understand, and, and they early on, they, they understood MJM and took full advantage of it and uh, as they had the right to. And at the same time, I think the, the, the companies that, are, that we've begun to see since then are more small to medium-sized companies. I mean, we fought through two years of the pandemic just to be able to get the word out, to be able to communicate the strength of the MJM program. Uh, but in the beginning, Northrop Grumman was one of the early companies that, that took advantage of it. And they do add tremendous value to our state. So, so we do get positive results for the state of Maryland through what Northrop Grumman receives in the program. Um, uh, but I, I, I do hear your comments uh, about a large enterprise, as much as small enterprises taking advantage of it. Thanks, I mean, uh, any, appreciate, appreciate other, the answer. Yeah. Thanks, if, Mr. Chair. If anybody else has any anything they'd want to add to it yeah thanks jerry good i think delegate smith has a follow-up question or maybe another topic Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess it could be considered a follow-up or related. It was nice chatting with you last week. Great to see you because Enjoyed my hair wasn't working. So now you know what I look like. It's great. <laughs> um, Thank you. But my question is like, you know, when you, you have such a big charge with the Department of Commerce, it's all about, you know, shaping and supporting our economy. And so that's a very big, you know, um, responsibility. So when you're trying to figure out kind of related to the conversation you had with my colleague, um, does your agency have like equity lens that it deploys in order to ensure that the program really meets the need of its charge specifically for um, smaller businesses, emerging businesses, and businesses led by women and people of color? Do you have an equity lens? And if you do not, would you like to have one? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, uh, Delegate, um, we absolutely do. And I'll, I'll answer it in a couple different ways. Um, let me first comment on, um, uh, on the, let's call it the rural uh, areas of Maryland, and then come back to uh, to the minority-owned, women-owned, small businesses, veteran-owned, et cetera. Uh, when I came into this position uh, initially, chapter one, uh, January 2015, um, a comment that I made early on was that, as we all know, from a from a, a wealth standpoint, from a standpoint of industry mix, um, the state of Maryland is the, as diverse as any state in the country. We have 24 jurisdictions, 15 of which we define as rural. Uh, and the comment that I made early on was that we cannot be great as a state if we weren't great everywhere. It wasn't good enough just for the big guys, um, Baltimore County and Howard and Montgomery and Prince George's, et cetera, um, to be successful if the Caroline and Dorchester's and Allegheny's and Somerset's were failing that we all needed to reach our potential. Um, so our team, our regional reps, we have regional reps throughout the state, every jurisdiction. Um, they work closely with the economic development uh, directors. They work, work quote, closely with tri-county councils. And we've had a lot of success, but it's like everything else. You've got to work it every day, every day. Um, so it was a big deal when I was with the governor last Friday in Salisbury when he said we're going to create uh, as part of the supplemental, we're going to put $50 million out there in, a, in the rural fund for the 15 um, rural counties of the state of Maryland. So on the rural side of things, I think we have come a long ways, but it's one of those things you got to keep working it all the time. Coming back to uh, equity and diversity, women owned, minority owned, small businesses. Um, we were one of the, matter of fact, our Miss Bidfa program, which is overseen by MMG, Stanley Tucker and his team, they've had it for many years. That was the first program in the nation um, like it. Um, many states subsequently copied the Miss Bidfa program. 
So here we are today. We have uh, we have 5.7 or 5.4, 5.7. Um, there's also going to be some significant SS. Uh, uh, BIC monies that are going to also be coming into that program uh, in 2022. Significant dollars, much greater than the five million that'll go also into the women-owned, minority-owned small businesses. Um, that in the VLT, because again, I give credit to the to the visionary members of the state legislature when we got into the video lottery terminal business years ago to say, hey, we're going to take a percentage of that. I think it's a point and a half. And it's going to go into uh, 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 monies that will also go out to uh, women-owned, minority-owned small businesses uh, throughout the state. Um, and in some cases, because some of that money is designated where the, where the casinos are. But I think as a state, and I, I haven't studied uh, Delegate Smith, I haven't studied the others, but I think that we are doing a great deal um, relative to, to lifting up everyone in the state um, and not just the, the enter enterprises that already have significant depth and breadth and strong balance sheets. So I'm sure we can do more, but it's an area where I hear more good things than negative from the community, having programs to support them. So that's a long answer. Whoop. You mute, oh, sorry, mute. I accidentally there pressed it again. No, I thank you for your answer and also for your enthusiasm. I just wanted to um, note for the record that because Maryland is, um, you know, per the 2020 census, people are probably going to get sick of hearing me say it. We are the fourth most racially diverse state in the country and the most racially diverse on the East Coast. And also nearly one out of every three Marylanders is African-American. So it's very hard for us to really compare ourselves to not only nearby states or any other state and feel that we're like, knocking it out the park because the bar is kind of low nationally. So I just want to make sure that we continue to press for the mark. And I think we can continue to grow upon some of the good work we started. So thank you for coming by. Yeah. And, and, and Delgado, let me just add one more thing. Um, uh, you know, we have four HB, uh, HBCUs in the state of Maryland. Um, this, is, this is a tremendous period in time right now for the HBCUs. I mean, it wasn't that many years ago where there was a lot of noise out there. Do the are the HBCUs are they still relevant? Do they serve a what purpose do they serve, et cetera? And all of a sudden, we've gotten through all that noise, and having four HBCUs in Maryland, all who have their own niche, who all have their own strengths. Uh, I think that this bodes well long term um, as it relates to uh, entrepreneurialism, as it relates to innovation. Uh, Morgan State has some tremendous engineering programs. They've gotten a uh, David Wilson is uh, he's a rock star at Morgan. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of monies that are coming into the HBCUs, including the settlement that took place in Maryland uh, uh, last year, I guess. But between that and the federal government, uh, the HBCUs in Maryland are in a better place than they have been. Uh, I, I'm not even sure. Maybe ever. Um, but, but certainly at this point in time, um, and that's good because it supports what you were just saying, to have a really strong um, environment to support uh, the minorities, African-Americans and others to be in position to do great things in the future. Thank you in for Maryland. that. I'm a double HBCU alum, Hampton University, Howard Law. I got to put it in there. But also, um, I know that they've created the foundation of the Black middle class nationally. So I'm glad that you recognize that as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Delegate Smith. Thank you again, Mr. Secretary, for your service and being with us today. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. We have a number of uh, witnesses here testified or signed up to testify Thanks. on Commerce's budget. Um, Jerome Taylor and Barbara Ash from uh, Veteran Institute for Procurement, the VIP program. Are you all with us? I see Barbara. Welcome, Ms. Ash. Welcome. Yes, this thank is you. Jerome Taylor. Oh, and there you are, Mr. Taylor. Whoever wants to go can just go ahead. And well, um, if you don't well, don't mind, um, Mr. Mr. Chair, I will uh, go first and introduce our our, our veteran our, our veteran our VIP. Perfect, that's great. Thank you so much. Well, uh, Chair Barnes, Vice Chair Solomon, and members of the subcommittee, I am the National Director of the Veteran Institute for Procurement, or as we like to refer to it, VIP. VIP is supported by the Montgomery County Chamber Community Foundation, and I serve as its president. 
uh, VIP trains service disabled and veteran owned small businesses on how to accelerate their success in the federal market. And since 2009, VIP has trained almost 500 Maryland veteran owned businesses. And I'm here today to testify in support of the fiscal year 2023 budget request for the Department of Commerce and to also request that you restore our funding that was reduced during the pandemic. The 10% the cut has been extremely difficult these past two years for our organization. And, and I guess you would have to ask, well, you know, why, why is this so important? Um, because it works since 2010, Maryland veteran small businesses in the state of Maryland, those 500 companies have won over 4 billion. These are small businesses and only 500 have won over 4 billion and prime awards. That's real money here for small businesses and for the state of Maryland and for the communities they are located throughout the, the state. Since 2014, 27 of them have made the Inc. 5000 list and eight this year alone. And one of them is here today and you will hear from him. So is, and oh, by the way, we have 62 Maryland service disabled veteran owned small businesses waiting to take the program, but yet we only have four, uh, funding for 40 of them. And knowing this growth and this need for capacity, um, I, I, this, this program is an incredible investment uh, that you make in VIP and the veterans it serves. It adds significant value to the business community, the veteran business community and the Maryland economy. So please continue please consider continued funding for the VIP program. And now it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Mr. Jerome Taylor, President and CEO for Digital Forensic Services. He is a VIP graduate from our 2015 uh, program, and he has made the Inc. 5000 list for the past three years. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, thank you Ms. Ash, and thank you for the work that you do. Mr. Taylor, welcome. Thank you. Chair Barnes, Vice Chair Solomon, and members of the subcommittee, I am Jerome Taylor, President and CEO of Digital Forensic Services. I am here today to testify in support of the fiscal year 2023 budget request for the Department of Commerce. The department's budget provides for nonprofits like the Montgomery County Chambers Foundation, Veteran Institute for Procurement, VIP program. Digital Forensic Services is a certified 8A hub zone and service disabled veteran owned small business with a top secret facility clearance. DFS provide information technology and cybersecurity services to the federal, state, and local government. Our customers include the National Security Agency, the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. Digital Forensic Services is located in Prince George's County. In 2014, DFS consisted of three employees with an annual revenue of $230,000. After graduating from the VIP program in March of 2015, DFS has grown to 20 employees with an annual revenue of $6.1 million in 2020. For the last three consecutive years, DFS was ranked on the Inc. 5000 and the VET 100 list as one of the fastest growing companies in America. The VIP training program has provided digital forensic service with several competitive advantages to include the opportunity to accelerate growth and build relationship with prime contractors and government agencies, a network of over 700 successful nationwide graduates and receive comprehensive training and instruction by subject matter experts providing the best practice and strategies. I believe the VIP program adds significant value to the veteran business community and Maryland economy. Please consider continued funding of the VIT, VIP program. Thank you. All right, Mr. Taylor, thank you so much for that testimony and for what you're doing. Are there questions for anyone from VIP, Ms. Ash or Mr. Taylor? And Sandy, so thank you both for being with us. Uh, we have two members from Meridian. We have our uh, 
Stanley Tucker, who's with us every year, and great to see you. And we also have Timothy Smoot. So welcome, Mr. Smoot, Mr. Tucker. Hey, Stanley, good to see you. Yes, sir. Chairman Barnes and distinguished members of the uh, Education and Economic Development Subcommittee. Uh, my name is Stanley Tucker, um, president uh, of Meridian Manager Group, and Mr. along with me is Mr. Tim Smoot, who is vice president, chief financial officer of Meridian uh, Management. Thank you for this opportunity to participate uh, and to support uh, the Commerce uh, FY23 budget. Meridian Management Group, was, we were formed in 1995 and is a private for-profit fund development management firm with particular expertise investing in small minority women and veteran-owned businesses. Uh, we currently manage the, the following funds, the Maryland Small Business Development Financing Authority, the Ms. Biffer COVID-19 Emergency Relief Fund, uh, a portion of the Invest Maryland Venture Capital Program and the Maryland Casino uh, business Investment Fund, which is one of the video lottery terminal fund managers uh, ministered by the uh, Department of, of Commerce. Um, Ms. Smith has been, we were created in 1978 for the purpose of promoting the viability and an expansion of businesses owned by economically and socially disadvantaged businesses and other small businesses that, that can't meet the credit criteria of financial institutions and commercial sureties and consequently unable to obtain adequate financial assistance on reasonable terms. The agency has four complement, complementary components uh, that provide lines of credit, including mobilizing contracts, long-term loans, loan guarantees, letters of credit, contract surety, subordinated debt, and equity financing. The maximum amount of financing to be provided, each applicant under the contract Financing, long-term guarantee, and equity program is $2 million. The surety bond program provides bid, payment, and performance bonds for up to $2.5 million uh, per company. There's a continuing need uh, for capital. Matter of fact, our mantra is capitalism without capital does not work. So uh, according to numerous studies, including the, the state's most recent disparity study, uh, lack of access to capital uh, for businesses common in small minority and women-owned businesses throughout the country. The growth and development of socially or economic disadvantaged firms has always been vital to strengthening the state's economy. Ms. Bitford is and continues to be the state of Maryland's primary vehicle for providing financing to, for small minority and women-owned businesses. Uh, again, there are numerous studies that really speak to McKinsey Research has, has recently had a study, SBA has, has recently showed that their, their loans to uh, minority businesses is down 35%. And so there are continuing need for access to capital for small minority and women-owned businesses. And I'll stop there and turn it over to my partner, uh, Mr. Uh, Tim. Mr. Chair, Mr. Subchair, Committee members, thank you so much. Just want to provide a little bit of detail. I know you all are moving fast, so I'll jump right into it. You know, uh, uh, MMG is keeping busy uh, through the Ms. Biffer programs. Uh, last fiscal year, uh, we financed $5.6 million in uh, capital to small minority women-owned businesses. Loans range from $50,000 to a million and a half uh, dollars. Uh, we created uh, 69 jobs and help retain 175 jobs. So you see, we're kind of busy all across the gamut. When folks ask, you know, what kind of businesses are you helping? Yeah, we're helping some of the larger businesses. We're helping a lot of the mom and pop businesses. So we uh, uh, go across the gamut. The, uh, over the last five years, we financed almost nearly $32 million in financing, uh, again, ranging from $35,000 up to $1.5 million. And those uh, jobs retained was uh, 1.1 1 .1 million, I mean, 1,100 1, and uh, 709 jobs created. Uh, uh, and with a loan loss uh, rate of 5.8%, which is pretty good. The, uh, if, uh, back in 2012, 2013, after the Great Recession, the loan loss rate had jumped uh, to 13%. So we brought that uh, back in, in balance. Uh, just in general, we have provided uh, 71 percent of the loans have been made to minority businesses and 31 percent have been made to women-owned businesses. Uh, aside from the traditional programs, 
we have uh, we managed uh, last year, uh, late two, 2020, early 2021, uh, COVID relief funds uh, through the Miss Bedford programs. Uh, we were provided by the General Assembly, the governor, uh, governor's office, $10 million to deploy to Maryland businesses. Uh, we actually helped 135 uh, companies uh, with loans ranging up to $200,000. Uh, the five points, almost 5.8 of those dollars were uh, converted uh, to grants. Uh, so those uh, monies did not have to be repaid in an effort to really help the businesses regain some of the capital that they uh, lost and sacrificed during the pandemic. Uh, an estimated uh, 146 jobs were created. Another one, uh, uh, 1,160 jobs were retained. Uh, and in terms of uh, who, uh, the deployment of the money, 68% uh, of those funds went to minority businesses and 42% went to women-owned businesses. So we really th think we uh, did a pretty good job and the, with the department's help of uh, deploying the capital across the state uh, to those businesses that really needed it. Thank you, so I'll leave it to that, Mr. Chairman, answer any questions. Thank you. Appreciate you, Mr. Smoot. And Mr. Tucker, always great to see you. That's always great, Mr. Chairman. Any uh, questions for Meridian? And seeing none, thanks to you both for being with us. And going to Georgiana Windley from Kenton Arrows Development Foundation, and I'm going to also turn it over to the vice chair for just a moment. And Georgiana, you're on. Good afternoon, all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with you. Thank you uh, for listening to us today. I'm Georgiana Winley, Executive Director of the Kent Narrows Development Foundation. And we're a redevelopment organization located on Maryland's Eastern Shore. The foundation is here to support Governor Hogan's proposed $2 million increase uh, in, uh, it, uh, to the Maryland Tourism Development Board's appropriation for building awareness of the state as a world-class destination. This year, a boost to the Development Board's appropriation is especially needed, and here's why. It's no secret that the travel and tourism dependent destinations and businesses have suffered in a disproportional way due to travel restrictions, shutdowns, workforce and supply chain disruptions, and the consumer's reluctance to travel. Let's reflect on what's happened. 2020 was looking to be the best year ever in generating tax revenue for the state of Maryland. By January in 2020, sales tax revenue was up 11%. Compare that to June of 2020 when the sales tax revenue was down by 14% because of the COVID crisis. Unfortunately, that downward trend continues with sales tax revenue down 31%, 31% for fiscal year 2021. Our destinations, businesses, and attractions that serve the traveling public are faced uh, with being uh, competitive in a highly, just in a highly competitive marketplace, and they're faced with the task of rebuilding. And um, and are rebuilding their entities within an uncertain economic environment. As of now, the recovery is anticipated to last at least eight to 24 more months. That time frame is predicted to be even longer for some travel related sectors. The Maryland Tourism Development Board plays a critical role during this time of economic recovery. And it really serves as a lifeline uh, to organizations like ours. And, and let me tell you, in the Kent Narrows, we're in the process of opening new tourism dependent businesses that were under construction prior to the pandemic. And we must work to retain the existing businesses uh, and jobs here that are inter interdependent. It's the restaurant industry, the seafood industry, and the commercial fishing industries that are, are all in interdependent. So thousands of jobs are on the line. An effort to stick with tourism dependent businesses and communities like ours will help to stabilize communities during this uneven period. These efforts also serve to showcase our state as a desirable place to live and to work and to do business. So this will boost and lift many. As a reminder, for every dollar spent on tourism promotion, $31 are returned into Maryland's economy. We ask that you look favorably upon this request. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Winley. Um, I am next going to turn to, uh, I have a Michael Haney listed from uh, the Maryland Center for Hospitality Training. Good afternoon, Chairman and uh, Co-Chairman. Uh, my name is Mike Haney, President of the Maryland Center for Hospitality Training, a minority-owned business. I respectfully request that the governor's recommended budget for the Maryland Tourism Development Board and the Office of Tourism Development remain as set forth in the budget. I have testified over the years in hearings such as this no less than 20 times advocating for small and minority owned businesses in tourism. This one, however, is the most important as the survival of many of our businesses hinge on our ability to market and bring consumers back to Maryland. Many black businesses did not survive the pandemic and others are hanging on by a thread. Coming out of this pandemic, it is important our marketing efforts are very aggressive to influence travelers to return to our wonderful state where you can go from the mountains of Western Maryland to the ocean of Eastern shore in one day. The CIAA basketball tournament being held in Baltimore this week is off to a fantastic start. Hotels and restaurants have not seen this type of activity in more than two years. And it has been a significant uplift to black and small businesses and a rallying point for our city as well. However, we need more than this one tournament to survive. I concur with Secretary Gill on the significance of cutting $2 million in funding, but looking at the augmentation of the federal money to push forward aggressively for an industry that was decimated, probably the most decimated industry in our state over the course of the past two years. So again, I respectfully urge you to support the governor's budgets for tourism. And I thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Haney. And I think we're, uh, we're all really excited to see the CIA tournament uh, in Baltimore. So hope, uh, glad to hear that it's going well. Um, are there any questions for uh, Ms. Winley or Mr. Haney? All right, uh, we're going to move on to, uh, I have a uh, Nicholas Cohen, uh, I think I see him there from the Maryland Citizens for the Arts. And uh, we just ask our witnesses to try to keep your remarks to two minutes. We still have a couple more agencies to get through. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, um, honorable members of the subcommittee. Again, my name is Nicholas Cohen. I'm the Executive Director of Maryland Citizens for the Arts. Uh, we're the nonprofit organization that serves as a statewide advocacy group for public investment in the arts. Um, I'd first, I'd like to thank Commerce and the State Arts Council, of course, for their continued work, uh, especially during the pandemic. They got out uh, about 12 million uh, in COVID emergency grants uh, to over about over 1,600 organizations and also many uh, independent artists. And I also applaud the State Arts Council for um, their equity and inclusion lens that they've really adapted over the past. Uh, two, three years uh, and their work in that realm as well. Uh, but today I'm here to provide a voice for thousands of concerned arts constituents across Maryland. And to that end, that end, I respectfully ask that lawmakers reject the governor's proposed Maryland State Arts Council budget for fiscal year 2023. As stated by the analysis from Emily, DBM's new funding interpretation lowers the State Arts Council's appropriation drastically over the next five years. It's really, a, it's a devastating interpretation, honestly. And I'll also say that DBM has also has managed to change its interpretation or ask to reduce funding for the Arts Council in each of the last five legislative sessions. This is also a troubling trend, especially given the fact that the return on investment for the art sector is huge, both in terms of tax revenues and really towards society in our state. Maryland Citizens for the Arts has worked with the General Assembly to further invest in the Maryland State Arts Council via Chapter 145 in 2016, the 2017 BRFA, and again to codify the law further via Chapter 14 in 2021. The General Assembly passed these laws with bipartisan support, and when interpreted together, the law is clear that the Arts Council's mandated formula must include one million for the emissions and amusement tax. It does not, however, state that it should at any time be removed in order to calculate the final appropriation for the next fiscal year. The General Assembly was clear and voiced their support across multiple legislative sessions as to how the Arts Council should be funded. 
Given the extreme economic challenges suffered by the arts sector from this once in a generation pandemic, we must continue to invest and support in our credible arts organizations and artists across Maryland. Now is simply not the time to reduce funding. And so with that said, I respectfully ask this committee to continue their steadfast support of the arts and reject the governor's proposed appropriation and fully fund the State Arts Council at the mandated level of 29.8 million. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions for Maryland Citizens for the Arts? Well, thank you for your passionate advocacy. We appreciate you being with us today. Uh, I think that wraps up commerce, so we can move on to uh, next on our agenda, Salisbury University. Sarah Baker is our analyst. Ms. Baker, welcome. Thank you. Let me just pull, share my screen with you. So I'm going to begin with exhibit one, which shows the trends in first time applications. And this provides an early indication that students would come back to campus. As the pandemic continued in the fall 2021, institutions in general expected a decline in the percentage of accepted students who would enroll. And therefore, they increased their admittance rates. And Salisbury was not an exception. They increased their rate to 79% in fall 20 and 26% for 21. And despite the higher acceptance rates since fall 2019, the number of students who enrolled decreased by 304. Exhibit two shows the trends in fall enrollment, which declined for a second year. In fall 21, enrollment declined 6.9%. And since the pandemic, enrollment has fallen 13.1%. And this has been driven by a decline in continuing students, especially this past fall when 539 students and 35 students did not return. On a brighter note, after three years of decline, the number of transfers increased by 40 students. And after dropping 17% in 2020, there was a slight increase of, by three students in first time students. We asked the president to comment on how Salisbury will be able to stabilize enrollments and back, back, bounce back to pre-pandemic levels. And will this lead to change in the business and academic models? and comment on efforts to reverse the decline in continuing and transfer students. Turning to exhibit three and the retention rates, why it does not appear that the pandemic affected the 21 cohort in which the second year retention rate declined by one percentage point to nine, um, 79%, it does seem to have impacted the 20 cohort where the third rate declined to 62%. Exhibit four um, shows the graduation rates. And overall, the recent rates for all students has exceeded 74%. And for the last two cohorts of African-American students have maintained a rate of at least 70%. Exhibit five compares the six-year graduation rates of PAL and, and non-PAL first-time full-time students and transfers. And overall, PAL students graduate at a higher rate than non-PAL students but interesting um, transfers, both PAL and non-PAL students graduate at a higher rate than first-time full-time students. Turning to exhibit six in affordability, this compares the cost of attendance to the net average price. And overall, the net average price is almost 30% lower than the published price. Exhibit seven shows spending on institutional aid and why spending has almost doubled to um, 11.8 million by 2020. That spent on need-based aid fell by almost 50%. And this is due to a prior change and uh, due to a change in reporting where prior to 2016, students with financial need who received the scholarship were reported as receiving need-based aid. And now they're reporting as receiving scholarships. By 2020, need-based aid only accounts for 15.7% of total expenditures. Turning to uh, the federal relief funds, as shown on Exhibit 8, Salisbury received a total of $32.2 million, of which $14.4 million was designated for financial aid. The majority of these funds, $16.8 million, are to be expended this fiscal year. Exhibit 9 shows how these funds that were not designated for financial aid were used. And as you see, almost all of the funds, about 16.8 I mean, 17.6 million were used to cover tuition and fee loss, revenue loss due to declining enrollment and auxiliary revenues related to reducing resident hall occupancy in 21. Exhibit 10 shows the budget changes by program area for 21 and 22. And overall expenditures increased 18.3 million. 
Of the 3.7 million increase in institutional support, about half of that is related to contingency funds to cover revenue shortfalls and or unanticipated costs. Salisbury has already overspent its budget for COVID-related testing and monitoring and therefore will be dipping into these funds. The 1.3 million of the increase in instruction is related to funds received in the supplemental budget last year and are being used to hire five positions in the College of Health and Human Services and equipment for the Medical Simulation Center. In terms of revenues in 21, um, due to reducing expenditures, the federal funds and auxiliary surplus, you can see that Salisbury was able to put 9.4 million into its fund balance. However, in 22, due to declining enrollment, Salisbury revised its tuition fee revenues down by 4.9 million. So in order to cover the ENG deficit, they would have to use auxiliary surplus in a transfer from fund balance. However, um, things were looking a little bit brighter by the end of December and Salisbury expects actually did the shortfall in ENG will be 6.7 million and they will have a surplus of 7 million on auxiliary, auxiliary, which would cover that deficit. Um, Salisbury notes that they need to be realistically assessing the future state of enrollment and related revenues, and they are currently looking for efficiencies across campus. We asked the president to comment on the budgetary impacts of enrollment projections and efforts being taken to identify efficiencies to better align the budget with the projected revenues. Exhibit 11 shows the proposed budget. And overall, after adjusting for salary increases and deficiency, state funding increases 10.9 million or 17.3%. General funds increase 11.6 million, which is slightly offset by about 700,000 decline in half. Increases in state funds include 4.8 million um, related general salary increases, 3.3 million to restore the 21 BPW reduction, and 1 million that was mandated for our funding guideline attainment. Other restricted revenues only increased 2.7 million, of which 2.8 million is an increase in auxiliary, and that's partly upset, offset by about $400,000 decrease in tuition and fee revenues. And while this estimate was based on the planned 2% increase in resident tuition, it also includes a projected 1% decrease in undergraduate enrollment. And just to note that the restricted funds do re decrease by 8.3 million, but this is due to a reduction in federal relief funds. Let's see if I can get this way. There we go. So in Exhibit 12, you can see the impact that COVID had in fiscal 21 when revenues declined by 4.2 million. The loss of tuition and fee revenues was partly offset by the use of federal funds. And in 22, even though tuition and fee revenues declined, total revenues increased 4.4 million. And again, this is due to the use of federal funds. And why in 22, the total revenues exceed the pre-pandemic level, the composition has changed, with state funds now comprising 37% of revenues compared to 28% in 2019. Tuition and fee revenues went from 40% to 35%, and auxiliary went from 30% to 26%. So just looking at personnel, which compares the authorized and filled positions between 19 and 22, during this time period, the vacancy rate increased from 5% to 6.8, and the largest increases in vacant positions occurred in student services, which is of concern because these are our frontline positions who work directly with the students. And finally, um, recommendations is to see the USM overview for system-wide recommendations, and that concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you, Ms. Baker, for the great analysis. Any questions for our analyst? Let's see anyone, we can take the uh, presentation down, just double check, yep. All right, so we can move forward with our agency. We have Salisbury University. Dr. White is with us and Mr. President, I understand you're retiring. So congratulations on that, but congratulations also on a great service to our state. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Barnes. Um, Chair Barnes and members of the subcommittee, um, as, as you know, I announced my retirement last fall from the presidency of Salisbury University. That'll be effective this coming June 30th. So this will be my last time before this esteemed body. And I take this opportunity to say thank you. Over the last four decades, I served in various educational roles at institutions across the country 
And I can say without reservation that your ongoing and continued support of students' pursuit of a higher education makes Maryland stand out. It's a major reason that Maryland continues to be a state with high educational attainment, high income potential, and one of the best places to live and raise a family. So again, on behalf of everyone at SU, and now as a grateful Marylander, thank you. Members of this committee are familiar with the challenges faced by higher education as a result of the COVID pandemic. And unfortunately, Salisbury University was no exception. One of the national trends that we're seeing as we slowly return to normal is that students are deci deciding to stay closer to home when they make their college uh, decision. We are taking actions to address our declines in enrollment and the changing landscape of higher education. In the fall, we launched a new branding campaign. We call it Make Tomorrow Yours uh, to help us better tell the story of opportunities offered to SU's graduates. During our rebranding process, we received input from students, faculty, staff, alumni, and members of our community, resulting in a genuine story about the SU experience. Early signs are that these efforts are paying off as our applications for admission and our deposits are already trending up and consistent with 2019, uh, which was our highest admissions year ever. We are engaging in new outreach initiatives to bring back some of our near completers and we've committed record funding to financial aid. The pandemic also exposed some significant areas of concern for our region and for the state of Maryland. We expanded our hours and resources at our Dave and Patsy Rommel Center for Entrepreneurship, which is located in downtown Salisbury. We want to help businesses get back on their feet and continue the pre-pandemic momentum when it comes to innovation and creativity in our state. We recently established the Center for Healthy Communities in our College of Health and Human Services with the goal of providing resources and support to historically under-resourced communities. Additionally, we're committed to increasing the number of our graduates in critical health care professions, such as nursing and health uh, respiratory therapy. In nursing, for example, uh, our students have the highest NCLEX pass rate among baccalaureate programs in the state of Maryland and we're not solely focused on those needs on the Eastern Shore. Recognizing the shortage of qualified professionals in the area of mental health, we are increasing enrollment in our social work program, which is currently offered at satellite locations around the state. We're going to do our part to improve that practitioner pipeline. Over the last two years, we've had to set up an on-campus public health operation to serve both students and employees. We continue to test, contact trace, and provide vaccinations and other services on our campus. And that's because we decided that if we're going to be open, we are committed to doing so safely and in a way that does not present a burden to our regional healthcare system. I'm proud of our ability to keep students safe and for our attention to the growing challenges related to the mental health and wellness of our students. In addition to providing in-person resources and services, we expanded operations to include on-demand telehealth visits. We found that many of our students even prefer this way of seeking care over traditional in-person appointments. We also recognize that although we are dealing with the pandemic, it has affected everyone differently, particularly those who come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. At SU, we made sure that our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion was reflected in our COVID policies and our actions overall. As president, it's been my goal to foster an environment where everyone has a true sense of belonging on our campus. I wanna take this opportunity to thank Chancellor Perman and his team for their support during these very challenging times. Chancellor Perman's leadership and that of the USM allowed us to navigate this pandemic while also maintaining our commitment to the important initiatives and programs that our students depend on. I also wanna thank Sarah Baker and her team for their thoughtful analysis. It can be difficult to have someone open the books and tell us what we need to do, but Sarah's professionalism and thoroughness make all of that very palatable. I believe I answered the questions during my testimony, but to put a finer point on two things, uh, for enrollment, uh, we are working hard to address enrollment declines, 
by engaging in new marketing efforts. Much of our decline was the result of larger than usual uh, graduating uh, classes as opposed to retention uh, decreases. So we need to bring in more students and it appears that that's uh, working so far. And finally, with respect to uh, alignment of our uh, education and general expenses, our employees to student ratio is already among the lowest in the, in the university system of Maryland. But we are looking at other areas where we can cut costs without negatively impact our students' experience. And with that, I wanna make it clear that we are in full support of the governor's budget. I am here with four members of my executive staff and we are happy to take any questions or provide additional uh, comments or details on the questions from uh, DLS. Thank you, Chair Barnes. Thank you. Are there questions for President White? Vice Chair Solomon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, President White, thank you for being here and thank you for, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, I hope you're, uh, hope you're looking forward to retirement. Um, I, I did have a very specific question, actually. Um, it, yesterday, I had a chance to spend some time with uh, some of your fantastic students who are running the on-campus food pantry, the Food for the Flock. Um, we have a, a bill that we're going to hear uh, in our committee, I think, next week on, um, on SNAP benefits for, for students, and I know it's something we spent a lot of time on last year. Um, and these the students are incredible. Um, it was amazing what they're able to do. I guess the one thing that I was a little a little disappointed on it didn't sound like they get any funding from the university it sounds like it's funded through um through student activities fee dollars or sort of the uh, the student money itself um, i was wondering if there's any thought on the part of the administration to you know work more collaboratively with them it sounds like i mean and it's all volunteer run um and and you know for example college park has an amazing new food pantry that i visited earlier this fall and they're doing you know, all this work, not only to make sure that their students are secure with food, but also running cooking classes, health programs. So it seems like there's a lot more we could do with, I mean, again, the program is amazing with what, um, with what the students are able to do with it, but would love to see the potential for, for maybe some, some more established funding and maybe some staff to, to help them. Thank you. Um, so the uh, Food for the Flock uh, Pantry has uh, been run largely uh, by uh, volunteers in terms of staffing. Um, but uh, in addition to uh, support that they get from student fees, they also get uh, some uh, donations, not, not only donations in food, but also monetary donations. And, you know, my wife and I were uh, happy to uh, uh, make a, a donation to the, to the uh, food pantry ourselves. Um, we have uh, our Vice President for Student Affairs, uh, Dane Faust. And uh, Dane, could you uh, comment on some of the staffing and funding for for that program? Sure. Thank you, Dr. White. I think, as uh, Delegate Solomon mentioned, yes, most of the funding comes through our student activities uh, fee, and, and Food for the Flock is sort of one of our student clubs and organizations. Uh, but there is administrative oversight through our PACE program, which is a collaboration or, or overseen by, by academic affairs, public affairs, and civic engagement. So, so administratively, there's support coming from that office. We actually, this past summer, uh, moved their location to a much larger location than, than they had initially had. Um, so there are certainly um, areas that we can continue to grow on. We're really excited. Uh, when, when, when Food for the Flock was established about, about four or five years ago, sustainability was one of the pieces that we put a lot of time into talking about how do we, we had a passionate, passionate group of students that were really excited about creating this program, but we knew in four years they were going to be leaving and going on to other things. So, so really sustainability was, was important to the development of that program. Thus having some funding come through our student activities office, but also having administration coming through PACE really was designed to make sure that, that it sustain and grow. That, that's great. I mean, I think I, I and, and, you know, they shared a lot of that with me. I, I think I would love to see, you know, maybe a staff person hired from the university to oversee it. I mean, you know, I, I know it's a priority for all of us that uh, unfortunately these, these services are needed um, and, you know, would want to just make sure that there's, there's support there. God forbid the students do, you know, trend, trend in a different direction or move into a different club, but um, would love to see maybe a little bit more uh, more resources put into that, but appreciate what you all have done. And again, the students are, are incredible. I think it's a great reflection on, on the university. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestion. All right, any other questions for Dr. White? I don't see any Dr. White. So 40 years of service to higher ed, is that what I heard? 
Uh, it's been about that, yes. Mm -hmm. That's great. How many years have you been with Salisbury altogether? Just finishing my fourth year. That's great. And, well, thank and you. I'm actually not leaving. I'm going to stay on for at least a couple of years and uh, teach in the chemistry department. Uh, so not, not going on to greener pastures. We are in Maryland to stay. You probably started teaching, right? That's probably your original passion. Yes, I, I teach one course a year uh, and uh, hope to continue that on, on a part-time basis next year. Well, that's exciting. We're glad to keep you in higher ed and serving our students. So on behalf of the entire committee, thank you for your service. Thank you. Good luck to you. That will complete Salisbury University. We have one last agency, BCCC, Baltimore City Community College. Ian Klein is our analyst. Mr. Klein. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So just bear with me for one moment, please. Okay, so we should be seeing the presentation now. I'm going to start on page four with exhibit one, which shows enrollment from fall 2015 to 2021. From 2017 to 2019, BCCC's enrollment grew by 721 students, or 17%. However, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, enrollment has fallen significantly from 2019 to 2021, decreasing by 1,045 students, or 21%. The continuing student and first-time full-time student populations decreased in both 2020 and 2021. However, one bright spot was an increase in the dual enrollment student population, which grew in 2020 and 2021. Elias asked the president to comment on the success the college has had in the, with the dual enrollment student population and if enrollment strategies for this population could be adopted for others. Exhibit two on page six looks at the successful persister rate for BCCC. While four-year institutions use graduation as a measure of success, community colleges use the successful persister rate. A successful persister is a student who attempts at least 18 or more credits in their first two years and who have, after four years are still enrolled, have graduated or have transferred to another institution. Exhibit two on page six shows the rates of college ready students, those who did not need any developmental courses and developmental completers, those who completed their required developmental courses and later completed their program course requirements. Students who are developmental completers at BCCC have tended to have higher persister rates than those who were considered college ready. This is proven true again for the 2016 cohort with developmental completers attaining a successful persister rate of 78% while college ready students attained a rate of 71%. Exhibit three on page seven adds the developmental non-completer category. Developmental non-completers are students who did not complete their required developmental coursework within four years. As seen in exhibit three at 27% for the 2016 cohort, these students have a persister rate that is significantly lower than the college ready and developmental completer populations. The last request the president to comment on what initiatives BCCC is undertaking to have more students complete developmental coursework as students who complete developmental coursework tend to have significantly better academic outcomes. Moving to education and general expenditures, exhibit four on page eight provides a summary of the budget changes by unrestricted funds by program from fiscal 2021 to 2022. The ENG total increases by 17.7 .7 million or 36.5% over fiscal 2021. And this funding includes 8.5 million for institutional support that is primarily for contractual services associated with the new enterprise resource planning system. 2.9 million in academic support for costs associated with adjuncts, tutors, and contractual vendors to support online learning applications. 1.9 million in operations and maintenance of plan for emergency repairs and deferred maintenance costs. And 1.7 million in student services as a result of filling vacant positions. Moving to the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic continues to have on the college. Exhibit five on page nine provides an overall summary of the total funds that were allocated to BCCC through the various higher education emergency relief or HERF federal and state stimulus programs. In total, BCCC has received nearly 25 million in stim uh, stimulus funding of which 8.7 million was required to go directly to students in the form of emergency financial aid payments. Exhibit six on page 10 provides the distribution of the various stimulus fund spending by year. As is shown, BCCC plans to expend 19 million in federal and state relief funding in fiscal 2022. In terms of the financial impact that the pandemic has had on the college, exhibit seven on page 11 documents the fiscal 2021 effects. For the 2020-2021 academic year, fiscal 21, BCCC moved to a remote only instruction model. With this shift, BCCC suffered a decline in enrollment and the corresponding revenue generated from enrollment, including tuition and fees, as well as aux auxiliary revenues, which totaled 1.9 million. 
when including additional lost revenues and expenses related to the pandemic, as well as the Board of Public Works reduction, BCCC experienced an overall budget shortfall of 5.2 million in fiscal 2021. The Triple C was able to address the budget shortfall by utilizing federal and state HERF funds, as well as identifying operational savings to offset that balance. The fiscal 2022 outcomes through December 31st, 2021, as shown in Exhibit 8 on page 12, documents the impact the continued enrollment decline as a result of the pandemic has had on the college's finances. In total, through the first half of the fiscal year, Triple C has a projected shortfall of 2.6 million. BCCC has already identified 1.6 million in HERF funding that will be utilized to address this shortfall, as well as noted that an additional 3.8 million will be available should the second half of the fiscal year also prove financially difficult. When including the 3.8 million in HERF that BCCC has identified to be utilized to offset shortfalls for fiscal 2022, the college will have roughly 7 million in HERF remaining for institutional purposes in fiscal 2022. President should identify how BCCC plans to spend the remaining HERF balance. Exhibit 9 on page 13 provides an overview of the BCCC funding formula. As is shown in the exhibit, absent hold harmless funding, BCCC's fiscal 2023 allowance would be $34.5 million or $5 million below the previous year's funding level. As a result, the hold harmless provision takes effect, resulting in the institution's funding level reaches, reaching $39.5 million. When the English for, others, uh, for Speakers of Other Languages funding is included, BCCC's total funding level reaches $39.7 million for fiscal 2023. Discussion of the proposed budget is found on page 14, with Exhibit 10 on page 15 identifying those budget adjustments. Of note, the personnel adjustments in fiscal 2022, totaling $1.4 million, are budgeted within the Department of Budget and Management statewide expense program as proposed efficiencies and are not part of the hold harmless calculation for fiscal 2023. The fiscal 2023 allowance, BCCC receives 4 million in additional funding to reflect fiscal 2023 personnel adjustments, resulting in a total general fund allowance of 34.7 million. For other state agencies and higher education institutions, these adjustments are again budgeted within the BBM statewide expense program However, for BCCC in fiscal 2023, these funds are provided directly within the general fund appropriation. With these funds now part of the BCCC general fund base appropriation, beginning in fiscal 2023, the new hold harmless level will be 43.5 million or $4 million greater than the current hold harmless level amount. Also of note, BCCC is scheduled to receive 5 million in PAYGO funds for deferred maintenance projects. When reviewing the personnel data for BCCC, as is shown in exhibit 11 on page 17, the college's vacancy rate has exceeded 20% since June 2020, and with a vacancy rate of 27% as of December 30th, 2021, is 23% higher than necessary turnover. President should comment on the continued high vacancy rate, identifying how much the COVID-19 pandemic attributes to this rate. President should also comment on any cabinet level positions that are currently vacant and identify when those positions are expected to be filled. Moving to the issues, which begin on page 18 and go through page 20, the one issue discussed involves full-time equivalent student enrollment and the Mayor's Scholars Program. As is shown in Exhibit 12 on page 18, total FTE enrollment has steadily declined at the college since 2011. The budget anticipates BCCC's FTE enrollment to grow substantially, increasing by 870 full-time equivalent students, or 29%, by fiscal 2023 when compared to the 2021 actuals. President should comment if the anticipated growth in FTE's enrollment identified in the budget is realistic given the steady overall decline in FTE's enrollment since 2011, and identify how the college plans to achieve these targets. Exhibits 13 and 14 on pages 19 and 20 provide an update on the outcomes associated with the Mayor's Scholars Program, which has helped to bolster declining overall enrollment, but produced academic results that are slightly below that of the non-MSP student population. Recommended actions are found on pages 21 and 22 request the submission of reports providing an update on institutional realignment, enrollment and the Mayor's Scholars Program, and IT infrastructure renovations. With that, I conclude my presentation and would be happy to answer questions. Mr. Klein, thank you so much for the great presentation. Are there any questions for the analyst? Just clear the presentation so I can see. It looks like there's anyone? No, don't see any hands. Uh, so let's move on to the agency um, and Dr. McCurdy, are you with us? Dr. McCurdy, welcome. I do have to ask you and your team to stick to the responses from the analysts um, and their questions. We have, unfortunately, with Cannabis this morning, 
uh, adding to the agenda and appropriations with the supplemental budget. And we do have to vote before capital budget at four. So we've run up against it a little bit. But if you could just get to the questions, the analysts, we know the great work you do. Um, that'd be great. Thank you. I think you're on mute there, Dr. McCurdy. There you go. Good afternoon, Chairman Barnes and Vice Chair uh, Solomon. We certainly can get to the questions. I know we're um, up against the timeline. Just for the record, I am Deborah McCurdy, President of Baltimore City Community College in my third year. I'm joined by a number of uh, executives from Baltimore uh, City who will be joining us to uh, talk specifically about um, some of the um, attributes and many of the questions that have been raised and like many of our peer institutions, we are just coming back after 18 months on COVID. Um, most of us on virtual with our students, our faculty um, and our staff. So the college has returned administratively in late September, October, our students really have just begun to come back except for health sciences as of of uh, January. We're probably still about 65% uh, or so of our students still on virtual instruction. The other 30% or so are face-to-face -face as we begin this long transition to get our students back into um, uh, on-site um, instruction. Um, let me turn um, directly to um, the questions. Um, you have the analysis uh, from Mr. Klein as well. We are going through a great deal of transition at the institution. Much of that is very, very positive in terms of our realignment mandates um, and meeting many of those, uh, certainly with our new ERP system, which is going to change the entire operation at the institution. And we're at, on the verge of that level of implementation. Let me go on uh, then to the um, questions and our responses uh, to the five questions. Uh, the first question on page um, five has to do with enrollment and indicates that the president should um, uh, talk about uh, the dual enrollment uh, student population and um, if successful strategies for this population could be adopted for others. I would say given what you are seeing on page five that we have been uh, very successful. If you can see I arrived in 2019, our enrollment has uh, almost uh, doubled since 2019 for dual enrollment. I think it's a pocket of students that the college simply has not um, and had not taken full advantage of as we work with Baltimore City Public Schools, private schools, and other entities to boost dual enrollment as we have conversations with Baltimore City Public Schools regarding dual enrollment and the number of classes. The classes have, have gone up significantly. When I arrived, they probably had five or six classes. Um, we are up to about 41 course sections. We're in 10 high schools. That number continues to increase as well. And as we uh, continue to have conversations about dual enrollment and the difference it will make in these students' lives if we push for every student to leave Baltimore City Public Schools, our number one feeder, um, to have at least one or more collegiate classes um, before they, um, they leave. So the courses have expanded, the schools have expanded, the enrollments have expanded. We have full-time faculty as well who are teaching on-site in the public schools. I think part of the uh, the downfall is during the uh, extreme COVID periods, many of the students in Baltimore City Public Schools and our major population do not do as well in terms of virtual. We certainly had students who did not have often the technologies that they needed in order to perform um, appropriately with virtual classes. A lot of that has been responded to and um, we have met some with technology for our students. We've had partnerships with Comcast to ensure uh, that students could um, uh, take advantage of being uh, in online courses and so forth. And in spite of all of that, I think that uh, the dual enrollment population has increased significantly and we're continuing to grow that. I would see that that population will grow 
Um, even more significantly, I just left a state where my former population was 50% um, of our total enrollment at that institution. And I think there's good advantages here for us to push dual enrollment um, with the support of Baltimore City Public Schools. That's dual enrollment as well as our PTEC populations um, as well. And I see Mr. Thomas is here. He's our vice president for uh, continuing education and outreach and has a great deal to do with the PTEC uh, populations. Mr. Thomas, do you want to talk a little bit about PTEC? Uh, he may it's have frozen. Michael, you, he is frozen. Uh, Dr. Jones, are you on? Yes, I am. There you go. Uh, you both meet jointly. This is the academic vice president, uh, Dr. Lizo Jones, and along with Mr. Uh, Thomas, they uh, co-lead the PTEC operations at the institution. So Dr. Jones, is, Mr. Thomas is frozen. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the PTEC initiatives as well? Yes, absolutely. So PTEC is in three high schools in Baltimore City. We have four pathways at Dunbar, one at Carver, and one at New Era. All of the pathways are growing, and we are looking to expand as we um, put the new grant in and the amendment. That new grant is going to look at offering uh, additional pathways out of Dunbar and uh, new programs that we're designing in health sciences. And I see Mr. Thomas has just become unfrozen, so I'll let him add as well. He's yep, giving sorry, thumbs up. Him. Looks like you covered it. <laughs> yeah, I think we're good. Um, you know, the only additional to add is we continue to partner with city schools to increase enrollment and to increase participation uh, in the PTEC program. Great, thank you for that. All right, Mr. Chairman, I can go on to question two. Um, that has to do with our developmental coursework and commenting on how well our students are doing in uh, developmental coursework and students who do complete tend to do um, better as well. We can see that our completion rates have increased um, over the four year uh, period from 26% to 36.4%. These are some direct initiatives regarding developmental education. Many of the students who we receive um, I would say 95% plus of our students coming into Baltimore City um, uh, Community College need at least one or more um, developmental courses. There have been significant efforts on the academic side uh, to begin to look at additional support, whether we're talking about uh, embedded tutoring, whether or not we're talking about auto enroll, uh, other support for special um, advisors and so forth. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, would you talk a little bit more about the developmental coursework and some of the direct initiatives? That is a huge part of our population that really absorbs a great many resources as well. Absolutely. So when we went remote, we shifted all of our tutoring to a virtual model. And what we were able to do was auto-enroll, meaning that a student, if they were registered in Math 86, would automatically enroll into a tutoring shell. And they would therefore have access immediately to tutoring help. We embedded tutors in our high-risk courses that would then take resources to the tutoring shells, provide them to all the students. The students had roughly 24 seven access to information and to tutors in those courses. And we saw this just this fall semester alone, over 6,000 entrances and access to the tutoring shells in our developmental courses. So it's been very successful in helping our students uh, navigate developmental courses and get through them. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Was there a question? Well, okay. You can just take questions at the end. I think, is that? All right. Yeah. All right, let me go on then to uh, question three. It has to, um, do with the HERF monies that the college has received and that we should identify how we plan on spending the uh, remaining HERF funds. There are a number of, of uh, categories with breakdowns, um, certainly in terms of campus security and replacement upgrades. There is a huge project that will take the college to a new level for college safety and security. It has to do with cameras and door access so the entire college will be 
re-outfitted with cameras and access at swipe cards and so forth. That will be a huge change at the institution. That will be coming in at about $3.4 million to totally convert the college to a new level of, um, of security and safety. Uh, student aid as well that we will be um, moving to um, also support students or tuition and fees and that will certainly absorb a, a great uh, amount of the HERF dollars um, institutional support in terms of other types of, of training, lab upgrades and so forth. We have facility upgrades, um, other institutional um, support in terms of our Lucian training with our new ERP system, our new banner system. And so we have fully covered the HERF dollars. In fact, we're probably looking uh, now at coming up a little bit short in terms of the HERF dollars as well. And Miss um, Waitsman, she is the institutional uh, controller. Miss Waitsman, do you wanna add anything to the HERF dollars and the HERF spending? Absolutely, Dr. McCurdy. Um, just a little bit on the student aid. Um, we're gonna spend about 4.2 million of the student on student aid, and that includes about 3.5 million to assist uh, students with tuition and fee assistance to help those with their balances that have been impacted by COVID-19. It will also include uh, support for the Mayor Scholars Program for the 2022 summer uh, bridge program. In addition, it will continue, will continue to provide free books to all students <clears throat> in the summer as we have been doing the last two years. And we will also continue to provide free shipping on all books for all semesters as we have been doing for the last two years. Um, and one other, one other point on the instructional support that is going to help with CDL training and upgrades to several labs, including the, um, the dental hygiene lab. And for the camera project, it's uh, about 459 cameras will be uh, included, 750, 740 doors. And that also includes you know, warranty and uh, training and unlimited usage. And I uh, will put it back to Dr. McCurdy. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, question four has to do with personnel and the high vacancy rate and identifying how we will move forward through the high vacancy rate or cabinet uh, posts. We have two cabinet posts, one recent um, VP for finance and administration vacated in uh, the first week in January and the VP for um, advancement. As we look at our vacancy rate and we look at what's going on in Maryland as well as the nation, we are not Escaping that, we have many, many retirements as well, resignations as a result of people coming back. Many people are still preferring um, to work from home. We have many people going out with ADA, with FMLA, um, other medical um, reasons as well. But we are, along with every other institution in the state, suffering under the uh, great resignation um, um, uh, uh, challenge uh, in this state. Um, it's a highly competitive uh, workforce now where last year we probably had triple the amount of, of uh, resumes coming in for vacated positions and we're seeing a great deal of slowdown there. Um, we are still responding to task five of the realignment which also calls for comprehensive review of all positions at the institution. We're doing that, we're realigning, we're combining um, some things that need to happen, the operations that need to happen um, at the institution as well. So we're putting the students first. It is a different culture. It's challenging for some personnel. So we expected when I came in three years ago, discussions with the board as well to say, we were going to begin to lose staff as we changed a very challenging uh, culture to one that is more dynamic and more student centered and student focused um, as well. So there are plans for filling the positions where we have the greatest need, certainly the leadership um, as we continue to fill the leadership uh, positions um, as well. Uh, let me go to question five. It has to do with enrollment and um, MSP. And the question has to do with, uh, given the overall decrease, um, really can we achieve our overall targets? I think the answer to that really is yes, that we are forging ahead. We've given you one smaller chart for the winter enrollment in terms of just looking at ways to redefine 
how we enroll and how we outreach. Uh, winter enrollment makes made no sense earlier. We've seen in the last few years that that has doubled as we've begun to offer more courses during the winter session. It may seem like a small number, but that model then transcends into the other semesters as well that looks at what are you offering, how are you offering, what are those times. The demand obviously for students um, was high and we certainly had a banner year this year for um, our enrollment um, overall. We've changed some of our policies that make sense concerning our enrollment for students. Um, the college had a very um, um, antiquated policy here where students really could be dismissed from this institution um, simply after one semester, maybe where they have not done well. So you move from being on warning right to um, a dismissal um, status, which didn't make sense. So you were in good standing. Then if you had a semester where you didn't do well, you're on warning. Beyond that, you were then dismissed from the institution. That's kind of unheard of. Most institutions have, you're in good standing, you're in warning, you're in probation um, prior to being dismissed. And so there should have been um, much more effort on the retention of students. We've begun to put that in place. We've changed that policy with the board. Um, just that policy changing alone, what we identified would have saved hundreds of students um, each semester as well. I can ask, I know our time is short. We need to get as well to the recommended um, actions and we only have uh, one modification there, but wanted to see um, uh, Ms. Hawkins, um, BP Burrell, if you wanna respond um, to the uh, head count and our opportunity to continue to hit those targets that are big targets. And quite frankly, we were on our way in 2019. If you look at the enrollment, you could see the increase in enrollment and then COVID hit. And um, that's when we began to see as with our counterparts, the enrollment declining. So uh, Ms. Hawkins is the director of um, institutional um, um, research and Ms. Hawkins, if you can speak quickly to, to that as well. Certainly, good afternoon, everyone. Um, had it not been for the pandemic, we believe that Baltimore City Community College would have hit an enrollment of 5,000 thereabouts um, in fall 2020. However, like our 15 community college peers across the state, we experienced a decline. And actually that decline continued across the state in fall 2021 with all of the community colleges experiencing a 10% decline. And actually BCCC fell in the middle of that decline where the, the ranges fell. Um, we are hopeful and we are building the, the bridges with the dual enrollment opportunities in particular. The winter enrollment was an uh, an incredible success. Uh, honestly, the um, ex expanded course offerings, the increases in enrollment, um, the demand for the courses. So in working with that and building the relationships back with the city schools, the, the team across the college is more engaged in those uh, conversations than um, in prior years. And we're, we're seeing those changes, um, being in tune with the um, type of courses that the students want, the modalities that they prefer, whether they be um, interactive virtual, meaning, you know, they're still interacting with the instructor or face-to-face -face on campus or hybrid or fully remote. Uh, the team at BCCC is moving all those initiatives forward and, um, you know, in engaging with our colleagues across the state, everybody's experiencing challenges. It's been a challenging return um, since the pandemic. And, but there's no reason to think that with these types of efforts, um, that the state as a whole and Baltimore City Community College can't return to its prior enrollment and move forward. Okay, well, thank you, um, Dr. McCurdy. Thank you to your team. And thank you for appreciating our agenda here and, and the time restraints and getting right to the issues. I know we would have loved to hear more from you about the great work you're doing, but believe me, Delegate Smith won't let us forget it. So you're in good, in good hands over here on this subject. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, are there questions for Dr. McCurdy or her team? Okay, hearing none, thank you again. And that concludes um, our agenda here. Subcommittee, um, we're gonna- Delegate Burns, I'm sorry. Um, the recommended um, actions, if oh. we could speak to the three, um, we accept sorry, the yeah. recommended action for the realignment plan uh, report um, that would go in October the 3rd. We've met those 
timelines over the last two years, the year prior to my coming, they've all those uh, timelines have been met. So that means we'd be submitting um, in October um, to the uh, joint uh, chairs, uh, the full realignment plan. We're asking in number two, because there are three recommended actions, the enrollment and the Mayor Scholars Program in past years we've submitted in June and November of the same year. The problem is the June report, this is calling for enrollment and Mayor Scholars Program information. The June report for MSP is a little bit early because that means that the program is still ongoing when the report has to be submitted. So you would really be receiving information, more information from the previous year. We're simply asking, we're not trying to bypass the report. We're asking that the June and the November report be consolidated into one report instead of two reports. It's the same thing, it's MSP and it's the Mayor Scholars Program and enrollment. We're asking instead of two reports four months apart that we simply combine and do one report likely um, in the November timeframe for uh, 2022 20, uh, and ongoing. We accept the uh, recommendation to continue with the IT infrastructure renovation report. That would be a big one as we move forward with the new um, ERP uh, for the institution. So we're asking simply for a modification on, uh, on recommendation two. All right, thank you so much. Any questions with regard to the recommendations? Okay, thank you again, Dr. McCurdy. We appreciate you so much. Thank you, appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank so you. Committee, we're just gonna take, cause we've been on now for a couple hours. We're gonna take five minutes here. Um, you know, at four o'clock, we'll come back and vote. So just, you can hang on the Zoom. We're just gonna take five minutes to just uh, do what we need to do. See you in five.
All right, I think if we're all still on here, Michelle is here. And we'll just give Delegate Rice one second. Looks like he's popping on, Delegate Smith. All right, cool. Uh, I think, well, how many, we have three or four bills, Michelle? We have three bills. Three bills. Delegate Forbes has a bill. Tell us about your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is um, HB 444, which um, closes a new loophole in the Save for College plan. The Save for Co College plan is a state contribution plan for low and moderate income families that open 529 plans and contribute. The state will also make a contribution. There was pretty widespread abuse reported, and we closed most of those loopholes, those known loopholes last year with HB 1238. Um, a new one erupted. And so this one. Um, bars custodial accounts from being eligible for the state contribution. Yeah, Doug Forbes, you've been bird dogging this for a couple of years now, so we appreciate that. Is there a favorable motion on this? Motion to move favorably, especially for those of us that soldiered with Delegate Forbes on the uh, on the review <laughs> commission. So thank you, Delegate Forbes, for for continuing with this. Great. Is there a second? Second, I tried to do the camera. <laughs> I saw it. Yeah, I it. All right, all in favor, any discussion? Anyone have any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed, raise your hand. All right, I think we have Delegate Crosby's bill. Michelle, do you want to tell us about that bill? Yeah, and I just think for transparency, it doesn't look like anyone voted against that bill. I just want to confirm. Okay. I don't think anyone voted against that bill. You can't see the yellow hands on the public stream. Um, Delia Crosby's bill, the bill increases the percentage from 50% to 100%. Um, the state must provide St. Mary's College for the COLA wage increase. This bill already passed the Senate unanimously. All right. I think there's a, any discussion. We'll make a favorable motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. All, right. All in favor say aye. All opposed, just raise your hand so the public can see. You're opposed? All right, well, it's not which bill are we voting on here? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was Delegate House Crosby bill. It was unanimous in the ha in the Senate. It's over here. Michelle, do you want to? Uh, House vote? Bill 54, Delegate Grace. And I think House rules say you have to be on screen to vote, Delegate Grace. Oh, shoot. Yes. So we'll give you a sorry. second. I would like to be recorded in the It says name. I cannot start your video until the host has stopped it or something. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Start my, okay. There you go. Thank you. All right, I'm a no vote on that. Okay, we have two no votes on the Delegate Crosby bill, uh, but it passes. And we have one more bill. This is Delegate Boatler's bill. We have House Bill 330. It would require all higher education institutions to, um, all students to take a under United States history course. Yeah. We, we, not obviously not going to prescribe curriculum to our higher ed institutions um, unless there was something just very dramatic. Uh, so I will move unfavorable. Is there a second? Second. All right. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the unfavorable say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Raise your hand. Aye. Nay. <laughs> There's my yellow hand. There's my DNA negative. <laughs> right, that bill is dead. All right. Thank you, subcommittee, um, for your votes. Any? That's it, right, Michelle? All right. We'll see some of you at Capitol soon. Thanks.